Hi there, everyone. My name is Stephen Stewart, and I am the Associate for Outreach and Public Services at the Hackney Library at Barton College. Today, I'm speaking with best-selling author James W. Hall about his latest book, Hit Lit. In October of 2009, Mr. Hall was the featured speaker at the Friends of Hackney Library Fall Dinner and Lecture, and his talk, called The Literary High Road, dealt with some of the same concepts that Hit Lit deals with. In this light, we thought it would be interesting to catch back up with Mr. Hall and talk about his latest book. Good morning, Mr. Hall. Your talk here at Barton back in 2009 was quite a hit, and the concept of not being a snob, as you said, really seemed to resonate with a lot of people. Can you tell us a little bit more about your new book and maybe give us a little taste of what it's all about? Well, thanks, Stu. Good to, good to be with you again. And I had a very nice night that night, too. It's a lot of, lot of great folks at Barton College. Um, well, this uh, hitlet is a result of a lot of different uh, converging uh, forces. That uh, One was... Uh, a class that I taught for off and on for over 20 years at the university here in Miami where I am um, and uh, I, I started teaching this course on bestsellers kind of as a whim uh, I had a, a very dumb uh, and pretentious idea that I would uh, teach these books and these big successful commercial books and make fun of them for a semester, uh, mock them, and show how, the, how they were inferior to the literary canon that we studied normally. And um, I, I wasn't really, I hadn't really read a lot of these books. I'd seen the movie of Gone with the Wind, but I'd never read Margaret Mitchell's uh, novel. And the same with several of the other books that I did in that first class. And I was stunned to find, uh, as I was reading these books, that I was just blown away by them. And I, I, it, it uh, made me have to go into my class and confess to them that uh, I, we have to change directions because I, I like these books, I had discovered. And uh, they were greatly relieved because they liked them too, and they were afraid to admit it but I, but I, because they were afraid I would make fun of them. So that course uh, turned into, um, as I say, 20 years of teaching that course off and on with lots of different bestsellers on the list. We did it a different way each semester. And the, the idea gradually evolved over time that I, I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to see if these books, as dissimilar as they were in many ways, uh, might have some common denominators uh, in them. Okay, well that kind of leads me to the next question here, and how exactly did you arrive at this list of, of books? Well, as I say, uh, they that evolved over a long period of time. Um, at, at the beginning, I just was collecting that, you know, this list, and it was uh, much shorter, and uh, that was just one of the many things we did in that, that class, but it, it seemed like an interesting thing because the students found it uh, useful to compare these books and see what, if anything, they, they made them similar to each other. So, you know, it was only, it was only a, a long and gradual process that I got to uh, the 12 that I list and hit lit. Uh, Although the the list could have been longer, there there are other uh, recurring features that we found over the years. But uh, I decided just for the to keep the book somewhat compact that we would I would just look at twelve books and and discuss twelve recurring features. Okay, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the uh, some of the similarities between the, the these twelve? Well, sure, sure. Um, I mean, it's, well, let me say this one thing before I, I start doing the specifics of the similarities. Uh, I was also, I'm also interested in the book and trying to see what, if anything, these 12 features might have in common themselves. And uh, that also was an interesting issue that, that developed in this class over time. Um, because the features themselves, when you hear them, they seem, some of them seem somewhat predictable and you would 
you know, who would have thought otherwise that, uh, that these things would be in bestsellers? But to, to talk about where, where they come from and why so many people, uh, millions of readers respond so passionately to these 12 things, that's at least as important as, as hearing the list of features themselves. But to answer your question, what one, uh, one issue is uh, to find, you almost always find, uh, whether it's Gone with the Wind or The Godfather, some hot button issue, some uh, issue that's related to uh, controversy of some kind that's, that's existent in the, in the culture of that moment when the book is first published. For the book to uh, have lasting power, I believe, and to, to outlive that, uh, its popularity in, in the year or two that after it was published, those uh, controversial issues that it has uh, tapped into uh, have to be pretty crucial, pretty central, and they have to, those hot button issues have to stay hot over time. And as, as you can th imagine with a book like Gone with the Wind, some of the issues had to do with race and Scarlet, the way that she mercilessly manipulated people. Those issues, those two issues of, of several that are at work in, in uh, Gone with the Wind, obviously are still very much on the agenda today. You know, we, still, we talk about the 99% and the 1%. That whole notion of the people who who uh, are motivated by money and are greedy and uh, materialistic uh, that that really irritated a lot of people in Scarlett O'Hara's day. You know, the, the time in 1936 when that book was published, and it still stirs people up passionately. So that's one of the issues. Okay. Um. We also noticed that in looking at this list of, of, of 12, um, that all 12 of them had been adapted for the screen. Um, do you think the fact that people are familiar with the movies has any impact on the popularity of the books over time? Oh, over time, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it keeps films, if they're any good, uh, keep the book in the public, uh, in the public's imagination. But, um, you know, I try to deal with that, that very question in a paragraph or so in the book. Um, the, the facts are that uh, Gone with the Wind sold a million copies in its first year, long before the David Selznick movie came out. So it was uh, one of the biggest, if not, it was at the time the biggest bestseller of all time. Same is true with the Da Vinci Code. They, the Da Vinci Code sell, sold millions and millions, multiple millions, before the film came out. And the film, by the time the film came out, years later, after the book was published, the film, by many accounts and, and my opinion, uh, wasn't nearly as good as the book, and probably 90% of the people who saw the film had already read the book. So I don't think it's... it's um, necessarily the key, a key issue in the popularity of a book, but certainly yes. The way I approach that question, though, in the book is, uh, in, in Hit Lit, is that the thing that, one of the things that makes these books attractive to filmmakers is the thing that makes them so palatable and, and engaging to a lot of readers, which one of those things is high concept that it's that you could see in a nutshell what the book is about and it's exciting it's some kind of exciting hook that's exactly what uh, Hollywood is looking for so the book the book writer has figured out a way to write a book that first hooks readers and then secondly hooks a Hollywood producer who wants to make a movie right right um were there any other books that you considered using, or did you, once you started this project, did you pretty well have this 12, um, these 12 narrowed down? Well, you know, I, I, over the years, over that 20 years uh, period, we, we looked at lots and lots of different, very big bestsellers. Um, uh, a book like Lloyd Douglas's The Robe, or uh, Pearl Buck's The Good Earth. The Good Earth. Um, 
books that were extremely popular in their day and are somewhat popular still. Um, and so when it came time to write this book, um, that was one of my first issues was how do I choose uh, which 12 books to look at or which sampling to look at. And what I did was uh, I let somebody else decide that for me, uh, the readers. And I picked these books, uh, well, eight of them anyway, eight of the 12, um, purely right off of the uh, all-time bestseller uh, sales figure list, which you know is collected in a book by Alice Payne Hackett. Uh, called 80 Years of Bestsellers, and she just, she goes through and makes these long lists and tells exactly how many copies of each book were sold. So what I did, the very simple, basic thing, which was to simply go through that list and pick off, pick off the top eight books, and then I added four additional books to that list by John Grisham and Stephen King and uh, Tom Clancy, that were, you know, those were authors that you just really couldn't write a book about bestsellers unless you, and, and Dan Brown, that without mentioning those four writers as well. So I added my four, but basically the list is composed of the top eight all-time bestselling books. Okay. Um, does the knowledge that you gained from doing this research uh, for this book um, does it have any impact on your writing and also or your teaching of writing? Well, <clears throat> let's take the, my writing first. Um, I had been writing a certain kind of novel um, before I taught this course and uh, the first time in the early 80s when I first taught it. Um, and they, that kind of novel I was uh, trying to write was the kind that I was primarily teaching in my classes, which was uh, a very avant-garde, um, uh, John Barth, Donald Barthelme, Robert Coover, it used to be called uh, metafiction, now it's called postmodernism, kind of an experimental avant-garde kind of, um, and that, um, that kind of book, well, I wrote four of those novels, and they didn't succeed. They didn't get published. Um, they are still in my drawer. And I was getting pretty uh, discouraged about my, my writing career in that regard. I, I was writing publishing short stories, and that wasn't a problem, but I really wanted to write a novel. So these, these bestsellers, teaching that bestseller class really opened my eyes that there might be a way that I could write something that that straddled the boundaries between the high culture and the low culture, that it was possible to write a good book that was also uh, more conventional and more commercially acceptable. And so it was a very liberating experience to me as a, as a writer. A academically, uh, I have a, a lot more tolerance for including books on my reading list, which are uh, commercially successful books and are not necessarily the uh, the gold standard stamp of approval uh, books that I had always taught in the past, the, the Faulkner, Hemingway, the, the standards of American literature. I still do those courses and, and still enjoy those books and respect them. It's just that I'm, I'm a little more liberal about including books that are, are not such approved books for the normal academic environment. Gotcha. Um, do you enjoy writing nonfiction as much as fiction? Well, uh, <laughs> it's it's very demanding. Uh, I had never done it before, um, and I'd never written anything that didn't have dialogue and action and uh, you know scenes and all the things that fiction has that uh, that, that are very much in my uh, you know skill set now after writing so many books. So this was really the first time I'd ever written any piece of nonfiction that was this long and sustained. My, my number one issue when I first set out was to try to have a tone in this book, a voice that wasn't fussy, academic, uh, too intellectual, um, and you know just more uh, natural and easygoing voice. And that took a long time, just 
that itself to discover what that sounded like, how I was going to approach it. So it was it was very challenging. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I would do it again if somebody, uh, if I could come up with an interesting project and somebody was willing to uh, fund it. Yeah, I, I would be consider. I would consider doing nonfiction. It certainly is more fun to talk about nonfiction because there's actually a, a substance, uh, an, uh, a knowledge or fact uh, level. You know, uh, there's there's more of a more of a question and answer possibility with nonfiction as opposed to fiction. It's, it's hard to go out and, and talk about fiction in a way that um, is, is similar to the conversation that we're having here. Yeah, sure. Um, what is your favorite of the 12 that you picked? Or do you well, have a I don't know. I guess, you know, they, they all uh, surprise me in different ways, and, and I find them all appealing in different ways. Um, uh, I admire what all of them do in, in many, in, uh, I would say Gone with the Wind has got to be uh, the most impressive book just because uh, Scarlet is such a confounding, complicated, and uh, energized personality. I mean, she is uh, very, very gripping. Where say, take, compare that to Professor Robert Langdon in The Da Vinci Code, there's nothing very interesting about that guy. The book itself is interesting, and the material is interesting, the subject matter and all the information that you learn, and, and to a certain extent, the chase and the puzzle solving and all that, those things are interesting, but the character himself is, uh, is very bland. You know, compared to Scarlet, Scar the reason people get involved with Gone with the Wind is that that woman is so, or that young woman is so complicated and and uh, frustrating. You know, you, you love her one minute and you can't believe she's doing some outrageous thing the next. And I think that sort of uh, transcends uh, a lot of the, maybe the, right, the literary faults of the book, kind of the melodrama and the... Um, the cliches and some very st stereotypical characters. Uh, Scarlet is a very, very dynamic, three-dimensional, uh, powerful character. To Kill a Mockingbird is a little different than some of the others on the list. Um, now that I know how you chose them with the, the top eight best-selling uh, books of all time, it makes more sense, but it still seems a little bit different. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, on a strictly um, literary analysis level, uh, it's a book that can stand up to uh, literary discussion and examination um, better than some of the other books on the list. There's, uh, I think that's that's probably why you're sensing a difference between that and the other books. There's there's thematic and and other. Uh, complicated issues that are that are quite compelling and it's it's more artfully done uh, you know one of the things that uh, that we didn't talk about but it but it's very much a, a feature of what I discovered in the process here is that one of the recurring features is something that does these books don't have which is high quality prose they're, they're not exactly the most well-written books in the world. They're not poetic or, or literarily complicated on the, on the prose level. Probably To Kill a Mockingbird, in its very minimal, somewhat ironic uh, writing, is more sophisticated by some degree than, than anything else on the list. So maybe that's what you're responding to. Yeah, I think that's, that's exactly... Exactly right. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today, Mr. Hall. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. For more information about James W. Hall and his latest book, Hit Lit, visit www.jameswhall.com. For more about the Hackney Library, visit library.barton.edu. Thank you for listening. <laughs>